Hi, I'm Dr. Stephen Krieger from the Corey and Goldsmith Dickinson Center for MS at Mount Sinai in New York. And I'm Enrique Alvarez, and I'm at the, here in Denver at the University of Colorado Anschutz Medical Center. And uh, at the American Academy of Neurology this year uh, here in Denver, we presented the second part of a series of work that we've been doing looking at uh, pseudo relapses in multiple sclerosis clinical trials and trying to think about how to analyze the data so we can have a purer sense of the efficacy of our disease modifying therapies. So maybe we'll start by talking about what a pseudo relapse is. I think most clinicians know, but yeah. how would you describe that? Yeah, I think a pseudo relapse is uh, in a clinical event, uh, some symptoms that a patient would experience and kind of tell us about. Um, but they're not necessarily associated with inflammatory activity. Um, they, uh, we, we don't see MRI changes associated with them and things that can bring them up include a lot of different things, but usually traditionally, you know, I think infections would probably be at the top of the list, but right. it could be that they're overheated, stressed, not sleeping well, those kinds of things. Um, and they can last a variable amount of time depending on how long that trigger is for them. Right. And it can be hard in clinical practice to distinguish a pseudo relapse from a true relapse. And in clinical trials, it's also hard to distinguish them. Yeah, I think sometimes it's very clear. Um, sure. And so we know that sometimes in these uh, in trials and in clinical practice um, that they contribute a lot to um, the number of clinical events that we would see. Right. Um, but I think where we became interested, right, was this idea that uh, with high efficacy therapies that there is a lot more of these events than maybe events associated with MRI activity. Right. Um, and so trying to understand how much or how little they contributed to the trials was uh, you know, a big driver for us to kind of start looking at this. I think we both realized, as many other people have as well, that our highly effective medicines reduce new enhancing lesions by 95%, but they seem only to reduce relapses by 40 or 50%. And so something has to be compromising the, the purity of that outcome measure. So, right, we hypothesize that there's a lot of pseudo relapses happening in both the treatment arm and the comparator arm. I mean, that's a big difference when you sit back and think about it, right? right? I mean, you're going from, you know, something again, like in the 90s to maybe a 40 to a 50% reduction. Right. Um, and when we even look at new T2 lesions and sort of rebalance things, those numbers were holding true around the same percentages. And so um, we, we thought that this might contribute quite a bit. So we were lucky to be able to partner with uh, TG Therapeutics uh, and looking at their phase three trials for um, the ultimate one and two studies, and try to explore this question a little bit further um, as to trying to understand how many of their clinical events of these relapses that called that were called relapses to see how much of them were associated um, with MRI disease activity. All right. So at uh, at Actrums in uh, in Florida in February of, of this year, we presented the first piece of this work, where we found that if we looked at an MRI confirmed criteria for relapse, a relapse followed by a new T2 lesion, and looked only at those events that had an MRI correlate instead of a 50% reduction in relapses afforded by ublituximab versus teraflutamide, it was really more like an 88% reduction in those relapses, which sort of has some face validity to it. It's what we kind of come to expect in clinical practice. And then here at the AAN, we took this project a little bit further. Yeah, um, uh, Dr. Krieger has been very involved in um, uh, looking at the question as to uh, what constitutes a relapse within a clinical trial, what kind of criteria. And so the question was then, hey, can we modify uh, the different aspects of a, of a relapse to say, can we get closer to that 88% reduction uh, that we could see? And, you know, well, it was Maybe challenging. Maybe it was <laughs> a little bit of a challenge. Yes, it that's was. a good way to put it. I mean, you know, we looked at um, different stringent clinical definitions of relapse, whether a relapse had to create more of a change in EDSS or more of a change on the functional systems or all of the above. And even with this more stringent clinical definition, we were only able to refine this outcome measure to around 60%, a 60% reduction in relapse. It was only when we added back the MRI criteria that we got back to this 
88 or so percent reduction in relapses. Yeah, we even played knowing that infections were such a big part of it. Could we alter how mm -hmm. uh, long a little bit the, an infection could have been associated with the clinical event to help remove more events? Right. Uh, so we extended that to two months. Uh, and it, again, still wasn't very helpful in trying to clean up um, that process. Yeah, so in looking at the criteria for um, trying to set up that clinical picture a little bit more to become a little bit more stringent in criteria, right. there were a few things that we looked at to try and change this. Yeah, you know, so every relapse in a clinical trial already has a clinical definition. We tried to look for more and more stringent definitions of relapse. So a higher bar, if you will, for what constitutes a relapse. More of an EDSS change, more of a functional system change. Whether the patient uh, experienced a new maximal level of disability at the time of the relapse. Um, things like this incrementally to try to eliminate these pseudo relapses and fluctuations from the relapse signal. Mm -hmm. We also could change a little bit the criteria around infection to be mm -hmm. a little bit more inclusive uh, so that we changed um, instead of being an infection around a month uh, to make it two months mm -hmm. uh, and try to make it a little bit more inclusive of symptoms that might occur as infections are ramping up or down. Right, because the investigator might not have realized at the time of the relapse that the person had an infection that might declare itself a little bit later. Yeah, exactly. yeah. So by capturing that, we try to eliminate even more of the infection-related fluctuations. Mm -hmm. But even with all of that, we still only manage to get the relapse rate reduction closer to the truth to around 60%. We didn't get anywhere near that 80 or 90% reduction until we added back in an MRI criteria for relapse. Yeah, so I think what we sort of learned from this is even with the more stringent clinical definitions, we really need an objective marker to know that new inflammation has occurred, a true relapse has happened. And at this point, without an MRI correlate, the clinical definitions for relapse are still too noisy to really show the true efficacy of the disease. And I think future work that we're hoping to do will continue to look at objective markers for relapse. Yeah, I think it highlights a little bit kind of as clinicians when we're seeing patients, the difficulty in trying to figure out if, if a clinical event is, is really driven by inflammation or not. Um, and uh, clinically by itself, I might be a little bit too hard. Yeah, and so hopefully other biomarkers, and we're going to think about other MRI biomarkers and even serum biomarkers, may help us to further redefine relapse to get to a true assessment of MS disease-modifying therapy efficacy.